Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. So something they made a big deal of teaching us at the seminary is the difference between a theology of glory and a theology of the cross. Now, what exactly does that mean, and what difference were they trying to teach us? Well, a theology of glory seeks to study God and do His will for the purpose of puffing up one's own sense of self, for becoming more self-righteous. They do the good things they're supposed to do in order to feel better about themselves and to feel like they can account for themselves in the sight of others. A theology of the cross, on the other hand, studies God and seeks to do His will, but because we are helpless sinners in need of all that God has to offer. After all, the cross is the very stumbling block of the proud and self-righteous. Well, throughout our meditations this year on the book of Luke, there's been a theme that's come up multiple times, and it's called the Great Reversal. That's the term that we've come up with it. So, some of these phrases you'll recognize. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first, from Luke chapter 13. I believe I told you stories about how my dad used that to make sure that we didn't get at the front of the line for food after church. And then take the humble and lowly seat at the table, right? Don't sit in the place of honor, otherwise if somebody greater than you comes, then you're going to be humiliated and asked to seat lower. That was Luke chapter 14. And we see it again today in Jesus' teaching in Luke chapter 18. And as we're looking through this Scripture today and meditating on God's Word, I want you to ask yourself this question, where does my righteousness come from? So last week, Jesus taught us about prayer, and He continues with that theme almost as if He's answering the question. He says, you know, don't grow weary, pray regularly, pray daily. And now He's almost answering the question, okay, how exactly should I pray? And He does this by giving us some examples to consider. A couple of prayers are being given. And as we go through those examples, I want you to remember those two terms that I just defined for you a theology of glory, or a theology of the cross. Because in verse 9, Luke himself even tells us that righteousness is the key thing in this parable. He says, Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So the first one is the prayer of the Pharisee. The Pharisee stands by himself, so he goes apart by himself. So he's he's setting himself apart from the rest of the group, but not in order to draw attention away from himself, but the opposite, to draw attention to himself so that he is more noticeable. So imagine him coming to the empty space right here. He wants the eyes on him. Now, this would have happened during time of corporate prayer in the temple, when the sacrifice of atonement was being made each day, usually around 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock. So lots of people were coming up. He sets himself apart from that group, but in a way so that he's noticeable, and this is the prayer that he says. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I get. What do you think of that prayer? Did you count the number of times he said, I? If you did, you would have come up with five in that short prayer. And if you go back and look at the words again, whose actions are worthy of praise? God's or His? Well, maybe it'll be helpful if we translate it a little bit to more modern language. Here's maybe what the Pharisee would say today. Dear God, thank you for making me so kind and loving, not like those other hateful people. I'm a pretty good person. I treat others well, even when they don't treat me very well. I read my scriptures daily. I pray often. I tithe above 10%. 
What do you think? The Pharisee is clearly falling into the camp of a theologian of glory. He finds righteousness in himself. That's the answer to the question for him. It is in him and the things that he does. It's in his faithful response to God. His faith is in his ability to do things. And notice that he's praising himself in his prayer. He's not praising God because he's, in fact, the very person Jesus is addressing. He is one of those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Now we get to the second prayer, and this one's done by this tax collector over here that the Pharisee referenced, and he also separates himself from the group of people, but for a very different purpose. It says that he stands far off. He doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to draw attention to himself, and we're about to understand why. He doesn't even, he beats his breast, and he doesn't even lift his eyes up to heaven, which would be a typical posture of prayer. All of these things are signs of his humility and his sorrow. What's he sorrowful about? Well, let's see what his prayer says. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. How many times did he say, I? If you're counting, it's zero. And you might say, well, he said me, but there's a key difference between I and me. When you say I, you're the one doing the action. And when you say me, the action is being done to you. And whose actions do he think are worthy of praise, his actions or God's? It's clearly God's. In his humility, he doesn't want to be noticed by God or by man because he recognizes that he has no righteousness. He has nothing good to offer God. And so he has one recourse and one recourse only to throw himself at the mercy of God because he recognizes his answer to the question, where does my righteousness come from? <laughs> Certainly not me, only from God. And so he pleads to God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, maybe it might be helpful to translate that one to modern day language. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's the same. Our state before God is the same as it was then for the tax collector. Our plea to Him is the same because we also recognize that we have no righteousness of our own, nothing good to offer God, not even worthy of raising our eyes to view Him. So we have one recourse and one recourse only, to throw ourselves at the mercy of God. That is, in fact, what you just did this morning. In our part of the service called Confession and Absolution, that's the confession part. That's a prayer and a plea of mercy from God for one who deserves none of it. An admonition. I am, in fact, a sinner. I'm not like the Pharisee who's better than other men. Right? We join Paul in saying, we're the worst. Chief of sinners though I be, we sang that hymn today. So we, dear friends in Christ, are a people of the cross. We do not go about the study of God and the work of God in order to bring glory for ourselves, but rather to bring glory to Him. And it's no accident that the image chosen there is the cross. The cross is the picture of the great reversal. No greater reversal has ever happened. It is where the greatest, most honored, most powerful, perfect Son of God became the worst sort of criminal scum and villainy imaginable for you. He took all the sins of the world into His own body, your sin and mine, everyone gathered here and all who's lived throughout time and space. No greater reversal has ever happened than that. The Bible says He became 
sin. Truly the exalted have been brought truly low. We are a people of that cross. But what does that mean? It means that we, like the tax collector, have no righteousness of our own. We have nothing and we are nothing. That's why I wear a black clerical garb. It's a reminder to me and to you that I'm completely clothed in sin, that I have no good of my own. The only white spot is the part of the Word that comes from my mouth. The cross teaches us that because it is the price paid for our Lord Jesus to answer the very prayer the tax collector makes, that's what it cost God to redeem one such as I, because I have no righteousness of my own. And because you have no righteousness of your own, nor do I, Jesus gives you His own righteousness. That's what He's doing on the cross. And in order to do that, He takes our unrighteousness, our wickedness, our sin into Himself. So on the Sundays when I wear the white robe, that's what the white robe represents, a righteousness that clothes the sinner, not a righteousness that comes from me, but one that is placed upon me by a gracious and loving God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I still, and you still, do not have any righteousness of your own, but now you are clothed in the perfect righteousness of your Savior Jesus. And for those who humble themselves, here's what Jesus says happens. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified, made right in the eyes of God, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This great reversal message is not one of sorrow. It is one of joy. It's not a story of those who have a ton giving all of it up and ending up with nothing. Rather, like the tax collector, it's the story of those who have nothing, but through the grace of God and Jesus are given everything, not by any merit of their own or any righteousness that belongs to them, but by His righteousness graciously given. And that is what Jesus is teaching us in our gospel reading today. That's what He's informing us about, that He knows who you are, and still He goes to Jerusalem, to the cross, to enact that great reversal in our favor, the greatest act of love there's ever been, to give righteousness to those who have none, and life to those who only have death, to bring mercy to the sinner. Our God is a God of the unworthy, the unrighteous, and the helpless. It's a good thing, because that is what we are. And if the parable wasn't enough, He reinforces this with the image of small children. In the ancient world, small children are never allowed in places of importance because they're disruptive, they don't have anything to offer, no knowledge or skills, and so they're seen as a bother which is why the disciples are telling people to stop bothering Jesus with your small children. And what is Jesus' response? He rebukes His disciples and says, Let the little children come to Me, for the kingdom of God is made of such of these. Dear friends in Christ, we have a God of the helpless, the unrighteous. It even says there that they are infants. They can't walk to Jesus themselves. They have to be brought. That's how helpless we are. But Jesus calls us to Himself just the same through His Word and through His gifts and the sacraments so that He can give us the very thing we lack, life, forgiveness of sins, and His perfect righteousness. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. A simple prayer. But the answer has been given. The cross is the answer to that prayer. 
And his answer is, I do have mercy on you. I have cleansed you of all of your sin. You are mine. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, who has reversed our fortunes for those who have nothing to those who have been given everything, life, forgiveness, and salvation. May that guard your hearts in peace until He returns to make everything new. In the name of Jesus, amen.